afternoon, everybody. My name is Jean Van Veren. I am responsible for the healthcare sector in the UK. Today's really session is all about healthcare panels to actually discuss some key topics around what we're doing in healthcare. And what we've done is actually invited some key guests, customers of ours, who are in the healthcare sector to talk about their experiences around what they're doing around Alfresco. Um, and what we're going to do is introduce each of the speakers as they go through to talk about their organizations. But this is a panel, so it's not us about just talking, it's about getting conversations going. So just for a bit of overviews, who's from the UK? Okay. And obviously the rest of you guys from Europe, who's actually within a healthcare setting? Yeah. And who's partners? Okay, so it's a good mix. So we're going to try and make this interactive and try and cover all the bases, so, but do ask us questions. So the panel members we got is Frank Rankin from NHS Education Scotland. There's a gentleman over there, Frank. We got David Wallacher from Liverpool Women's Hospital. And we got Peter, that uh, codes from NHS England on the open source program. That's Peter. That is Peter. And what we need to go through the session and get everybody just to talk a little bit more what they're doing. So the first person we're going to introduce is Frank. Do you want to do it over there, Frank? That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Frank and I'm an Information Governance Manager, which is always a great way to uh, end a conversation at parties. Um, NHS Education for Scotland is a special board of NHS Scotland responsible for uh, workforce education and development. Um, so slightly different from other boards in that we don't deal directly with uh, patient services. Um, we first piloted Alfresco in 2011. Um, actually did a fair bit of customization uh, during that pilot. Um, when we went live in 2013, we actually reversed that a little bit and went more out of the box uh, with uh, the absolute minimum of uh, configuration customization. So we've really just in September of this year have come to the end of our first initial rollout. Um, I did a presentation to our board recently and the images I used for the, the this first phase was a baby crawling and our second phase will be a baby toddling. Um, so it's early days, we've got about a third of a million documents in there but that's pretty low. So some of our departments have only been in a matter of weeks, others have been using it for a year now and we tried to uh, move them away from the uh, concept of doing mass migration, really just current and live documents. 800 and odd users on 13 sites across Scotland. So we're not a huge organisation, but um, we're big enough for it to be fun. The business drivers for us were that we had the classic chaotic shared drives. Uh, so unlike some of the, the case studies you'll have heard today, we are not migrating from an existing document management or content management solution that was just uh, shared drive chaos. Um, the usual business drivers of increased efficiency, better collaboration, better uh, use of our knowledge, but more specific governance drivers, and that's really um, where I come in, um, compliance with Freedom of Information Scotland Act, Data Protection Act 1998, and a big driver for us, the Public Record Scotland Act uh, 90, uh, 2011, which um, for the first time requires all Scottish public authorities to have a robust records management approach um, and that's certainly for me where Alfresco comes into its own. Uh, in the first phase we haven't uh, real, we've really um, been focusing on guess, just getting users on board, doing basic document management functions. Uh, part of our second phase is really getting the, the, the records management functionality levered in. In terms of the challenges, um, getting a fit to our infrastructure has been tricky. Uh, we're an interesting organisation in that regard. Um, most of our network runs on Novell. Um, I think largely because our network services manager, the, the first syllable of the name is his answer to most um, change requests. Uh, I think that's why he likes it. But you know, we use Novell, we use GroupWise. The NHS Scotland standard browser is IE8. Um, to fit in with various national systems. So, we're dancing around these limitations and these challenges. Um, the other challenge that we've had to uh, overcome um, 
is the perception of users, the comfort of users uh, and their confidence in the security. That classic, people will be able to see my stuff and challenging that, that, uh, that uh, proprietary view of information. Um, because although we don't hold patient data, we do hold very sensitive information on practically the whole NHS Scotland workforce, their qualifications, their education, their development, uh, issues like you know, doctors and difficulty and things, so areas of real sensitivity. So uh, being able to present a robust account of the security model and reassuring those users has been key. Our big wins might not sound like big wins, it's basic stuff, but it's basic stuff that's a big step forward for an organisation used to chaotic shared drives. We are now, Alfresco now is the natural home for meeting papers across the organisation, from team meetings to the board. So we've moved away from emailing attachments to 40 odd people who then save it on the network, what have you. People are used to the concept of uh, using links to take them direct to, to meeting papers and other papers. We also have uh, entire departments who have now given up completely on their network drives. Now we're not pushing that, it's not a very directive organisation in that sense. That's the departments that themselves have said, right, you can lock down our shared drives. Alfresco is where we live for everyday business now. Um, in terms of taking it forward, um, we, uh, it's key to us that we get to the point, at, at the moment it's only people on our network can access Alfresco. The next step for us is to uh, make sure our external stakeholders can access that. Uh, I've put the cloud in question mark um, because when I did these slides we were still discussing our way forward, but we've actually, our new digital director this week has announced that everything in NHS Education for Scotland is going to go in the cloud, corporate and external facing. So we've got a bit, a bit of a paradigm shift there uh, to figure out uh, exactly how that's going to apply to information governance, to Alfresco, to our records management plans. I've mentioned that key to our, our uh, plans, uh, we're moving to 4.2.2 in November um, and at that point we're really going to focus on the records management functionality, the ability to manage records in situ uh, is a key one for us uh, and the other uh, ever present task is to go back to the people who uh, maybe didn't participate as full uh, heartedly as they could have in the initial implementation phase, see what the barriers are and get them into using Alfresco on an everyday basis. I know that was a bit of a rush through uh, but I was keen to cover it quite quickly so that we can have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll get through the introductions and then we'll open up the panel for discussion. So the next person to introduce David Wallacher. Is the CIO from Liverpool Women's Hospital. I'm David the tallest Orchard. people, a person here, I would have thought. Um, yeah, for, from a Liverpool Women's Hospital, we're a specialist women's hospital, the biggest one in Europe, essentially. There's only two hospitals in England that are specifically for women's services. So there's ourselves and Birmingham Women's Hospital. So it's a small hospital because it's, it's specialist by nature. So it's about 1,400 staff. It's about 110 million turnover. We haven't installed Alfresco yet. So I'm going to approach this from a different perspective as the others, but say why we purchased it and what we're planning on doing with it. Because essentially we are digitizing the hospital. We're, the patient records will be gone electronic, move out the way there, by March 2016. And that's been funded by the NHS England Tech Fund Wave 1. And we had an interesting sort of quandary where we digitize the paper records, we tell all the nurses and doctors we're taking the paper off you. And then corporately, we just drown in paperwork. Huge inefficiencies, as, as touched on in Scotland, exactly the same problems. We've got data stored everywhere, multiple versions of the truth, never a single throat to throttle, because there's always about seven or eight different versions of the same strategy. And th just the way that we run is wholly inefficient. The, an example, that our chief exec likes to send out comms bulletins as a PDF attachment. Now, who reads their comms bulletins all the time when they come in? They see it's from communications and, you know, you have a quick look. A simple one-page PDF that's emailed out to 1,400 people on Outlook 2012 will cost us about £75 in storage. Because it's got to go into the exchange file storage, then it's got to go into the replicated, then it's going into my Avamar. And so multiply that, £75 for one bulletin. But is everybody going to read it anyway? So my IT managers have been getting extremely annoyed with me because... I shrink the budgets every year, because that's what happens in the NHS, we've got less and less money, and yet our storage demands go up and up and up. So we decided we need to do something. We've got SharePoint in place at the moment, we don't use it properly, it's very clunky. We're essentially using it as the intranet in a bit of a document repository. 
the main system that people use at the moment but is, is essentially our email system. That's where everything is stored and then into shared trials. But because we're so regulated, we've got five specialties in the hospital. So we've got maternity services, obviously, gynecology, um, infertility. So anyone's got any experience of infertility services, I mean, it's regulated by HEFA, so it's another level of government's responsibilities. And then genetics. Um, and we're tendering on the 100,000 Genome Project, it's, or we will be, at the end of this year. And that brings a whole raft of governance concerns around the documentation there. If you think of, it's one thing holding clinical information about people, but we're holding their full DNA sequence. <laughs> Don't want that shared on the S drive. <laughs> so we, we went out, we've got, we have a sort of start at open source and work back premise within our trust. So if there's open source solutions out there, we look at those to start with. And Alfresco is this a standout. We're going to um, deploy it over three phases, starting in November, and run it in parallel to the clinical transformation. I can't have the paperless clinical notes by March 2016, and yet people turn up to meetings with lots of paper under their arms. And essentially, you take paper to meetings as a safety net. It's a comfort blanket. You, you don't need the paper there, because the director of finance likes to scribble on a piece of paper. Well, if she'd always scribbled on an iPad or annotated a PDF, she would be quite happy to do that, and it's the shift. And the standout for us when we looked at it at El Fresco was the simplicity of it. And actually, it's very difficult to give demos of El Fresco internally and make people go, wow, because it is so simple. The, the intelligence is in the back end where you want it to be. The, the front view is really, really simple. And we apply the sort of Facebook logic here. No one teaches you how to use Facebook. No one teaches you how to do your online banking. No one teaches you how to book your holiday on Expedia. You just get on and do it because it's simple. SharePoint, it's, it, it's, it's just not simple. So people don't use it. We've got to get the data flowing through. We've got to get the pathways. So we're going to have about 1,000 users in there. First phase, is that on the next slide, John? Yeah, the first phase will, will be to reduce our storage on the, on the S drives, get rid of those silos. We're going to start with board and work down to ward. So every committee structure in the trust in the next six months will go into Alfresco. The sec second phase then is about the sort of how do we interact with the patients? People need access to their health records. That's an interesting challenge from a governance perspective. And I think it's one that we haven't really answered in the NHS yet. But the thing that we do need to do is be more transparent on complaints, for example. So at the moment, if you put a complaint into your hospital, say you've done it via email, you'll fire an email into a complaints department, you'll get something back to acknowledge it's been received, and then after a set period of time, depending on the level of the complaint, you'll get a response back from the chief exec. Between sending it in and getting it back, you don't know what's happening. Until you've had the response, you can't challenge it. So one of the things that we've looked at with Alfresco, we set them the challenge, and you guys did it in, it was about a week, wasn't it, from me asking to come in to show me, was a way that we could have the complaint coming in either via the e-form or a monitored email box, um, or from a scanned letter, and then start a pathway process, but at the same time, allow the patient to log in and see the status of their complaint. So they'll see it's with the director of nursing, they'll see it's with the complaints team. And where that becomes really powerful is one, we're interacting with the patients, but two, it means the people that are writing the data have to set their game up, because you can't put rubbish in something that you're, you're publishing back. So that's our second phase of what we're going to do and share it out. And the third bit is, who, who was here from health sector, sorry? Is there anybody here that works across CCGs? As you know now, <laughs> the, the data that flows back and forth between secondary care and CCGs, especially this time of year, as we start entering contract negotiations for next year, is, is just tremendous. And again, the demands on the email systems are huge. The demands on how many versions of a contract do you go through, not just in health, but how many versions of contracts you go through before you sign it? There's a lot, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it's little small <coughs> version changes. We don't have strong enough control over our version of our documents. And the version control we do do on it is very, very simplistic. You know, version one, version 1.1. 1 .1. It, it's just not fit for purpose. What we're going to do is we're going to do all our sort of collaborative working with other hospitals, but primarily the CCG for next year's contract negotiations via a El Fresco site. So we will, within 16 months, we'll have a thousand users in there. We'll have about three million documents, which just sounds horrendous when you say three million documents, but that's the way it is. But it will also enable us to strip down and do that sort of quality checking. And then we're going to just drive through 
this, this sort of idea that the data, you know, data is useless without context. So actually the person that's written that document that saved it into their network drive, it means something to them. Someone else who reads it, if they don't understand the context, it's almost pointless. So what we need to do is ensure that we get the metadata on those document types, and the people went to the general sessions yesterday with the same with the search aspects, so that it becomes an intellectual property of the trust, not just a, a document that's on some ENC storage stuck away in the, in the back end whirling. So there are two challenges, and um, yeah, we think it's a, a marvelous product. Thank you, David. So um, just a, so well, we also quite, um, qualify a bit later on to clarify because there's some terminology probably used here. Yeah, it's very UK based, the CCGs and primary care. So, you know, that's the sort of connection between, well, you know, um, the sort of hospitals and the GPs, and that's that's sort of the CCG market. But the concept is about cross collaboration. So, next person I'd like to introduce is Peter Coates. And he's a man that can introduce himself. Mm -hmm. I'm always tempted to sing when someone hands me a microphone. Um, I'm probably just going to stay on this slide and maybe the next one rather than with, in terms of the time that we've got so just to explain to people in the room where NHS England fits into the, the NHS Federation um, NHS England is the commissioning body strategic commissioner for healthcare services in England so we hold a budget of about 200 billion pounds and that is used to commission providers such as um, David's Hospital to deliver services. Well actually we commission the CCG who then commission David's Hospital to deliver services but there's NHS England and there's Public Health England which is again another body holding rather vast sums of money. So we don't um, directly consume um, IT services or buy services other than for NHS England's own business administration. Yeah? My role at NHS England is to deliver our NHS open source strategy. So we've got a very, very strong strategy initiative to ensure or try and get more open source adoption in the NHS, in David's Hospital, in GP practices, in dentists, in opticians, in social services departments across the whole health economy for a range of reasons which I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of. Cost, interoperability, ability to configure and tailor software solutions if they are open source. So my primary role is to um, stimulate the supply market for open source solutions, of which Alfresco are one, um, and to stimulate the demand side uh, for open source solutions in the NHS, such as I don't really think I need to stimulate your hospital or you do I to take open source solutions. But as you can imagine, hospitals in particular are very risk averse places. Um, so they are, uh, they need some um, assurance that implementing open source solutions is safe for them and they won't be left high and dry. So we've developed a very um, health specific delivery model with the use of a custodian that is responsible for a particular distribution of open source code that can be accredited to be safe to use in a healthcare setting. Yeah? Uh, and the other major point probably to point out is that um, our key area of activity at the moment is in the clinical system space. Yeah? So we do have a separate little team looking at commodity type open source solutions. So your Red Hats, your Ubuntu's, your Libra Office, and Alfresco sort of straddles the clinical and the commodity space at the minute, if I'm being honest. But we're very much um, concentrating on um, the clinical space. So these are full hospital suites of software that are open source. That, uh, and we've got a number of those, and we've got one which started implementation this year at a hospital down in Taunton. Um, in terms of us being able to influence hospitals. We can't directly influence David or any hospital and tell them what to do because we're commissioners, but we can influence them. So one of our levers is the um, Integrated Digital Care Records Technology Fund. Um, we're now on the second wave of that. David's hospital was funded in the first wave. Um, the second wave um, monies hopeful, hopefully will be released or hospitals, um, health organisations will be informed at the end of this month. Uh, if their bid has been successful, 
we've had 233 bids in uh, we've interviewed 233 bidders and their teams um, graded them and then there will a decision will be made if they are going to be awarded funds to implement new technology systems there are tens of bids in for EDM solutions there are tens of bids in from hospitals who want to procure and implement an EDM solution a number of them have there are six that have specifically named uh, sp specifically said they want an open source EDM solution in their hospital and there are others who haven't decided or haven't named uh, the solution that they're going to go for so there's a significant opportunity there for um, open source developers implementers not just in the ADM space but across the whole of the uh, health economy in England uh, and that's sort of what we're doing brilliant thank you Peter so <coughs> What we've done is we've put a few sort of key points that we thought we might want to talk about in an interactive dialogue. Now, I appreciate some of this might be quite UK specific. So, you know, we can go through these and start conversations, or we can just also take some questions from the audience as well. Um, some of the key things we've seen, so obviously Peter mentioned the uh, integrated digital care record. That's the concept of digitizing the NHS. So from our perspective in the UK, we're doing a lot of work across a number of hospitals talking about our fresco become a repository to manage and store all the medical records. So that's one conversation. So I don't know in the wider Europe whether you've seen similar requirements in your regions, in your countries, whether there's drivers for that. So I'd like to open up on that point, um, but also feel free to direct any questions to the panel as well if you want. So does anybody want to start having some, asking some questions or any comments? Hi, uh, Marion O'Neill from Zizi. I just wanted to know, in terms of the last point about cross-organisational collaboration, is, is the tech fund also open to local authorities? Yes, it is, but obviously it's closed now. Is, so it was open. Um, will Wave 2 be? Or when three. It, it would be Wave 3. Wave um, obviously, a, a decision will be made by whoever... Prime Minister and Minister for Health is at the time, uh, whether there will be a wave three, but obviously the intention is we would very much like to have uh, the tech fund as a rolling funding program um, with demonstrable success at the end of each stage. But yes, in wave two or round two, um, local authorities, foundation trusts and trusts were the three legal entities that could be awarded funding. In round one, local authorities were excluded, but in round two, they were included. Thank you. Anybody else want to pick up on that point? Any questions on that? Uh, I've got a different question. Sorry, okay. John, but uh, it's for Frank. Um, you described that you had a few different ways of getting people onto the El Fresco system. Uh, sometimes you put them on it, I guess, forcibly in a way, and other times you let them kind of come on to it naturally. I just wonder what obstacles did you find using that approach? Because when we've done migrations, we've typically done it office by office and kind of said, well, Friday we're putting you off, Monday you're on. And it's not that kind of easygoing type thing. So I just wonder what problems you might have encountered and how you maybe got around them. Yeah, it is a cultural thing, and I've worked on migrations in the past in the civil service, which is a much more directive culture, where you can say to people, right, you're going to your training on Monday, you go back to your desk on Tuesday, and you'll be in an entirely different uh, environment. Um, I think NHS culture doesn't lend itself to that um, that level of directiveness. Certainly our organisation doesn't. Uh, I don't know if there are other reflections on that. Um, also, to be blunt, we didn't have the resource to be as heavy-handed as that. We were quite a small team implementing this. So we have relied on departmental leadership. And some departments have really embraced Alfresco, built it into their business processes and run with it. Others have been much lighter touch and we do have to uh, go back uh, and revisit them. So it's really been a matter of, of partly the political culture, partly the resources we had available that we had to be so easy going. Um, I would rather have been much more directive, uh, but my band doesn't allow me to do that. So. Thanks. Hello, I'm Victor from Spain. 
Uh, in our country, we are also using the electronic medical records in, in all of our systems, in fact, in Alfresco. But what do you think that is the main barrier? Because here, uh, you are planning to go paperless until 2018. What is the, is the barrier? What, what is the problem? <laughs> to be honest, I think the, the, the primary problem with the NHS for things like this is culture. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's how people interact with the paperless hospital. I think the, the technology to go paperless is there. You know, we're looking, at, we're looking at it now. I think the challenge is how do people interact with that record? Because if you try and force people down a, a, a solution that they have to use, I'll give you an example in an outpatient clinic. So if a consultant sees a patient, at the end of it, traditionally, they'll speak into their dictaphone for about 30, 40 seconds. They'll hand it over to their medical secretary, who will type the letter up and it gets sent out. About 15, 16 months ago, we moved to electronic discharge information from outpatients back to the GP, which involved forcing and that was, a, that was a force for that one, for the GP to type the information into the computer. What was taking them 40 seconds was now taking, depending on their IT literacy, but at least two, three minutes, which doesn't sound a lot. But if you multiply out that extra two minutes per patient when they're seeing 40 patients a day, by the end of the week, they've run out of clinical time. And then they instantly don't like the solution and you force them down the road. One of the things that we're, and this is why I'm sort of an advocate for open source, is I don't care how people interact with the data. So if the doctor wants to carry on dictating, dictate, and I'll find a solution that will transcribe that. If they want to handwrite, handwrite it, but I'll give you a digital pen and I'll scan it in. And we have to adapt to that. I think if you, if you force people down a certain path and say, you will work this way, it doesn't work. And that was one of the primary attractions of the Alfresco solution. Because immediately, you know, for, for, for um, document editing, I'm not going to say you have to use this one, you have to use that one. And I think that's been the primary challenge to get into paperless in the NHS, actually, was that we've become obsessed, or we were previously obsessed, with one solution and then force that out. And that's not the way we work. In the commercial, you know, it's, uh, IT nowadays is all about apps. It's, who, who cares how people interact with it as long as it's collected? Um, and I think that's where there's been a sort of shift now, because I think the culture of the NHS is changing to where we're more sort of open to this. And clinicians are open to it, because they come out of college. My daughter's seven. She's obviously not a doctor, but she, 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 she's seven. She came to my house the other week. She says, oh, Dad, you've got a Mac. So I was like, yes, Evie, and I said, and I can't work out how to use the mouse. So I've been PC for years. I've moved to Mac. I'm sorry for those that have always been on the Mac. So she showed me how to use it. And I was like, you're seven, Evie. How do you know how to use a Mac? She says, well, I have two hours of computer lessons a week and two hours of Mac lessons a week in school. Her homework is done on the iPad. She doesn't have a homework book anymore. She submits it. Universities, you can do online. You don't even go if you're doing a course now, you can just do it online, you can submit, and yet they've gone right the way through education, the sort of post-Google generation as such, so anyone born after 1982, they live in a complete electronic life, and then they walk into hospital and we say, oh, there's a piece of paper and there's a pen. And that's where the challenge has been, is breaking that cycle. Thank you, David. I think there's a question down here. Yeah. You talked a lot about the, the, the vision to go open source. Uh, is there anything in that vision to contribute back the way as well? To, to the open source products, because presumably what you develop for one health service is applicable to another, and there must be opportunity to kind of do some shared services and give something back to open source. I think it's one for Peter. Yeah, so our, um, our model is very much a collaborative model. So we intend to have a number of product-specific communities. So for example, Open Maxims, which is a full hospital, open source EHR, open eyes, which is a specialist ophthalmic medical record, so on and so forth. So there'll be one of these communities for um, each of the pro open source products. Those communities will have a legal vehicle behind them called a community interest company, which people may know what they are, they may not know what they are. But it's a effectively a special purpose vehicle uh, that its assets are protected in law by the kick regulator. They are a not-for-profit organisation, and they will be the custodian of the distribution of the software that's accredited to be safe to use in the NHS. Yeah, and they will act as a custodian, and they will they will gather in all the enhancements and additions and ideas around that software, and they will decide which ideas make it into the 
gold distribution of the code for the for the NHS. So our preferred license is in a JPL license, which means that if anybody changes the code, they've got to re-contribute that back. That doesn't necessarily work with all licensing and all systems. Um, but for example, in the tech fund, what we've said is that if you receive any tech fund money as a hospital and you make anything using that money, whether you make or develop software code or you make an assessment process or an assessment form um, or a configuration file, then all the software code has to be released on a full OSI license and any other assets such as documents have also got to be licensed on a Creative Commons license as well which will ensure that anything that we pay to be made is available for reuse free of charge across at least the whole of the NHS. Gentlemen over here. Thank yeah. you Peter. Um, the second question is for David and um, we have people, we've been using Alfresco for a couple of years now and uh, now they're grumbling they want to move to SharePoint. Um, what other grumbles have you had or what other experiences have you had of people moving from SharePoint to Alfresco rather than the other way around? Um, so the, the question on how we uh, approach the slow adopters again. Um, I mean, there are several strands to that. I mean, one is there there are increasing areas of business activity which you can only access in Alfresco. So at the moment, that's meeting papers. Uh, we'll move on so that it becomes um, the approval of policy documents. And um, we're looking at things like your expenses claims. Now, if you have to access Alfresco to make your expenses claims you're going to access Alfresco. Um, so uh, as partly that, making sure they can't avoid it because there are business processes that just require it. Um, on the, the softer side, it will just be a matter of sitting down with departments, looking at their use cases, demonstrating to them the real everyday benefits they can get. And it, it does have to be that that soft sell as well just because of the culture that we work in that becomes easier when we've already got good stories to tell in the organisation so because we've got departments who are beginning to use workflows who are you know just take Alfresco for granted now we're able to take their experiences and transfer that across the organisation. The other specific challenge we've got is a lot of our staff are sessional, so they are you know, doctors, nurses, uh, they are clinicians and three or four days a week they're out working in clinical practice, one or two days a week they're working in NACE. The idea of them having to get used to a new system is tricky and uh, that is where uh, the point that was made earlier about how easy, how um, how recognisable Alfresco is uh, as a UI comes into its own. Um, so we're just spend some time, quick coaching sessions with them, so that it becomes uh, less of a less of a barrier. Uh, that and reassuring them there's single sign on as well, because that, that's uh, always a bugbear is when there's a new password to be picked up. Thanks, Frank. I would challenge back with your question on the sh on the on the SharePoint aspect. In in the context that in the ten years I've worked in the NHS now, and in fact it was as bad when I was in the private sector, but it, I think the NHS is special at doing this, is that we've traditionally bought a solution to fix a specific problem, which means that we've only ever used five or ten percent of the functionality of that product. And I think the, my, my issue with SharePoint, apart from the new Microsoft licensing rules for the NHS, which I think it was easier to put man on the moon than understand Microsoft licensing at times, is I would challenge that back to why are they grumbling? Because actually, one of the things that we also do in the NHS, probably too much, is structured deployments of products. And you know, we have to do things like Prince2 and MSP if they're nationally funded to sort of evidence it back from an audit trail. But actually, we need to be more agile in how we deploy. We should be looking at more agile methodologies, things like Scrum, for example. We don't get het up on the print. And with a lot of the more agile sort of methodologies, the whole point is that the system's always been iterative. You know, it's always been updated. It's not the final solution. We just reinvent, reinvent, reinvent. And my challenge back would be on the SharePoint. I think you're, you constrict yourself. Could it do everything that you'd want it to do? Yes. Would it be way more expensive than Alfresco? Yes. 
would you need a specialist Microsoft SharePoint developer that sits on the box that runs it? Yes. Do you need to buy SQL licensing on quad core, 72,000 pounds, whatever it costs now? Yes. Would you need to replicate that twice because you've got two data centers? Yes. As a CIO, I could not approve a business case that looked like that at this period in our funding. It just doesn't stack up. It doesn't make sense. So I would challenge back for the people that are grumbling to say, well, improve it then. Because I haven't seen anything yet in the Alfresco platform that you can't do. It's how much do you want to challenge yourself? And that would be the, the pushback that I would give to that challenge. Thank you, Dan. Hi, I, was, I, I work for University of Westminster with my colleague. And I was wondering, do you use uh, any of the other functionalities that come with the Alfresco services? wikis and blocks, uh, data lists, and that sort of functionality. So do you only use it as a document repository? Um, standard document management is our standard as our main use and that's really what we looked at in the uh, first implementation. We are using it for blogging for internal communications so department heads, corporate comms people are using uh, blogging which is uh, being uh, aggregated into a, a, an in-house blog on our intranet and we're looking potentially at, at selecting some of those uh, for external publication. Um, we have some of our development teams are using the wiki functionality um, Although I think they've used uh, used add-ons for the wiki as well. I think there's a, a wiki add-on they've deployed because they 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 uh, uh, found that worked for them. Um, we have teams that are using data lists. So, for example, all our MP and MSP requests, uh, so parliamentarian requests, are all tracked on data lists. Our freedom of information data protection requests are tracked on data lists. Um, we are using discussion fora for um, uh, for service user groups so for example uh, you know the, we'll have a site for a particular application user group and they use the discussion forum to put forward ideas for potential change, re change requests so they discuss it and if they agree it's then taken forward as a formal change request to the development team so I mean I, I could go on that's, that's just a couple of, uh, of illustrations but certainly document management for most teams is the bread and butter use of Alfresco, but we have got some uh, examples of, of wider use of the functionality that we can go back and, and show to the rest of the organisation. Thank you, Frank. I think we've got about five minutes left. So, any more questions? Hiya. Um, really interesting um, with your um, <coughs> focus on open source in the NHS. Um, you paint a very sort of positive picture. Um, but actually, what are the downsides? What are the things um, that you have to deal with that you didn't have to deal with before? Um, technically, nothing. Culturally, a hell of a lot. Um, so there are lots of myths around open source, as I've said before, by the nature of the things that hospitals do and the litigation culture, uh, they are very risk averse. And, you know, it, they're, they're, it's easy to really not do anything, and it's probably safer for you personally. Will you get a better patient outcome? Will you get a better result? Will it be cheaper? No. Um, so we've spent a lot of time dispelling myths around open source um, and proprietary solutions and issues of safety. And probably the best example that we use are where we've had a proprietary software vendor who has decided to then release their software on an open source license. So a company like IMS Maxims, who um, have a proprietary product suite for use in hospitals, runs everything from patient administration systems to um, operating theatres to book and pathology, you name it. Yeah. Um, on Friday, earlier this year, around June time, um, you, could, you had to buy a proprietary license. You had to go to them and buy a license to get that software and use it. And you had all of the conditions within that proprietary license. They then decided to release that exact same suite of software on an AJPL license on a Monday, the following Monday. It was exactly the same software. The difference was there was less restrictions in the license. And you can go now to their website and GitHub and you can download Open Maxims full hospital AHR suite 
Yeah, for free. Implement it in your hospital if you've got the skills. Amend it and change it. And the only condition is it's AJPL, so you've got to contribute any changes that you've made back. So nothing happened over that weekend to make that software any more unsafe. And actually, of course, it's probably safer now because the source code is open, published. Thousands of pairs of eyes looking at it. Um, so for me, it's become actually inherently more safer on the Monday than it was on the Friday. Thank you. Um, there's a question earlier around whether you contribute back, um, <clears throat> and you talked about creating communities. Um, there's an interesting question around um, using public money um, and using that to create technology, software, IPR. Is it the case that um, no public money in the NHS is uh, used to create IPR, which you then don't own? You don't sell or give away that IPR. Is that right? It's, um, it's a very complex situation legally, particularly with foundation trusts who are incredibly autonomous and have lots of um, different rules in terms of how they operate. Um, we've specifically and overtly put that as a condition in the Memorandum of, un of Understanding, which you will have to sign to receive your tech fund money, which is that anything that you make in terms of software code is OSI open source, and anything else is on a Creative Commons, specifically and overtly. There is an argument that um, even without that, it's still the case. It should be free to reuse in the NHS. It's different for foundations, trusts. It's different for legal for different legal bodies. But we, um, there are you know very some very commercially aware foundation trusts who will develop something, and then will seek to recoup their investment in the thing that they've made by charging for it. And this can be anything from a paper-based assessment form, which can come out, you know, copyright, such and such foundation trust. If you want to use this as form, there's a £5,000 a year licence fee to make. I think, and it's, it's easy to criticise foundation trusts around that, but you've got to understand the mechanism, the machine that they're working in, that they're almost, to a certain extent, encouraged to do those types of things. So you've got to recognise that, yeah? So our, our delivery model around these developments is self-sustaining and self-sustaining financially. So we recognize that money's got to be spent, money needs to be made for these things to become self-sustaining. So in the model that I talked about, the IPR, which actually doesn't really have any value if it's on an open source license, you've got to credit people with it, but you can't sell it, you can't make money from it, um, that that is held with a non-for-profit entity. But trusts, will need to go to a commercial SI, software development house, support organisation, and then buy services to implement and support that product in their trust. So that's where the revenue generation is. Yeah. So you know, a company like IMS completely changed their business model. Their business model, their, their, their revenue and their income generation is now completely based on selling services around the open source product. It's not based on a licensing model anymore. Yeah? The concept being it's all about the size of the pie rather than your relative slice. Thank you, Peter. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Got to be one question. Come on. The point I was going to make was uh, in the, the earlier point in terms of confidence in the robustness, the safety of open source software and certainly in the specific context of Alfresco, I find the DOD 5015 certification to be useful uh, and it appeals to me as a records manager, as an information governance manager anyway, but when people do challenge and, and say, you know, can, do we have confidence in this product, I say, well, it's certified as being adequate for the document records management for a Los Angeles class attack submarine or a Nimitz class aircraft carrier, I think it can pretty much handle anything we can throw at it. So it's, it's using those other, uh, I know it's, it's not often seen in that context, but I think the, DZ, uh, the DOD 5015 certification is important for that, that credibility. That's a very good point. Thank you, Frank.
I think we're going to have to wrap it up. From our fresco point of view, we thank you all for coming to the session. I'll be hanging around and the rest of the guys, if you want to ask some more questions, please come and grab us. But thank you very much.